Hey everybody, today Rado runs through the Great Zimbabwe, which is a fairly heavy Euro game that came out in Essence Field 2012. It commands hugely high prices now already because it was an extremely limited print run and who knows when it'll ever get printed again. And a lot of people have been asking me for a run through of it because I guess they want to decide if it's worth all the money they'd have to pay to get it because it's gotten a lot of really good press. So I'm jumping right into the deep end of the pool, gonna run you through a few rounds so you can get a feel for whether it's a game for you. And I'll apologize in advance in case I make any mistakes because I'm still fairly new with the game, but I think I've got it down enough to where I can demonstrate it in action. So with the caveats out of the way, wish me luck. Here we go into the Great Zimbabwe. Now, in this game, players are taking on the role of ancient Zimbabwean cultures that are vying for dominance by erecting massive monuments to the gods. And you want to build them up higher and higher and higher. They can go all the way up to five discs tall, or at which point they are worth 21 points, or 13 for four, seven for three, and you know, all the way down to so a single disc is only worth one. So the higher they get, they are worth a ton of points. They can, they can be worth a ton of points, but you need a lot of resources to get them all the way up there. And to, to get those resources, you'll notice on the map, there are a lot, this is a randomly generated map, I should say, for two players. The more players, there's more of these tiles they spread out. But in this two player game, we've got some clay pits over here. There's this one place where you can hunt for elephants for ivory. There's a few forests, one diamond mine, and there's these six start spots you can choose. Now, let's just jump right into it. Uh, before the game starts, whoever, um, you know, in this game, I'm going to play first, which means Jen, who is second player, gets the benefit of being the first person to put a monument down for free, because we start with one monument in play. So Jen can choose any of these six starting positions, and she is going to choose this one right here at the mouth or the, you know, at, the, at the foot of this river, which could definitely benefit her in terms of transporting goods around, because you will spend a lot of time thinking about how do I get my clay all the way from down here to a a potter, you know, which has to be built somewhere on the map so that that pottery can then get transported up to this monument and the monument can be built. That's what the game's all about. Taking the raw resources, converting them into, you know, actual goods, and then getting those goods to your monuments to build them higher. It's like a three-step process. And being on a river helps with that because it means you can transport stuff much, much farther than normal. So that's why Jen's grabbed that space. And that's why I would have if I could have, but I can't. I got to choose one of the other spaces as first player. I will choose this one. It's not as nice as Jen's. It's still kind of close to this river. It might still benefit a little bit, depending on how things go, but it's close. It's, you know, it's kind of central, you know, uh, you know, kind of equidistant from everything. It's also very close to the only diamond mine in the country at the moment, so that's pretty cool too. And so, we have done our setup. You know, we, we got a randomly set up thing. Each player has put their starting monument out. Because we each have one monument, that means we both have one point at the beginning of the game. And now, the game will start proper. And let's look at the outline of play, shall we, that describes what we're gonna do. The first step of every turn is the generosity of kings. Where, basically, what players are gonna do is they have an auction, we have an auction to bid to see who goes first. And now, I already started as first player, so I gotta make the first bid to see if I'm gonna hold on to first player. And players start with three cattle. Cattle is money. There's no feeding anybody in this game. Cattle is just pure money. These could be gold coins. They just happen to be, you know, a bit more thematically appropriate money. And so to hold on to first, I think I'm going to bid one cattle to hold on to first player. And now Jen will have to raise me and see if she wants to. But what I have to do is when I declare, um, I'm going to pay my one cattle. What I'm really doing is I'm sending that cattle down to help, uh, you know, is the generosity of the kings. Apparently there's some big party and I'm going to send some cattle down and that's why I'll get to go first because everybody loves me for sending cattle. So I'm going to put some cattle down and I, I put it here on the leftmost player shield in this lineup of player shields. And I should say, the way this lineup gets happened, whoever is the player who's currently kind of has the most power, which is me because I at the beginning of the game I'm first player, places their shield down first and then every other player in, in, in turn in power order places it down next. So Jen is the only other player, but if there were more players, we'd line them up in a row. But in a two-player game, there's only two. And I put my bid on the leftmost one of these shields. So I will put my bid here. And now if Jen wants to raise me, she has to spend at least two cattle. She could raise by more. She's got three bucks. She could spend three. But you know, so she could get to go first. But at this point in the game, you know, this early on, I don't think 
there's that much of a mad rush to be first player. Plus, if she if she bid two to hold on to first player, she wouldn't have enough money to do much of anything. But actually, just for demonstration purposes, let's say she did bid two. She wanted first player. What she would do is she bids two. So. Um, she has to go into you know the leftmost space that hasn't gotten a space, you know, or right, basically she continues placing where I left off. I place this one, so now Jen would place one here, and then another one here, and and then if I wanted to raise her by three, I would have to place one here and then here and then here. Basically, the more the bidding happens, you know, these stockpiles of cattle fill up on these shields now. That really comes, that's a very important element later in the game. So I'll demonstrate it more. I just wanted to kind of just get that out of the way. There's kind of this funky way that's very, very cool. It has really big implications of how you bid. But for starters, there's nothing fancy going on. I'm just bidding one. It goes here on my shield because it goes on the first shield. My shield is the first shield. I bid one. Jen passed. And when Jen passed, that means she became the last player. And that comes back to me. That means I get the first player. And now we can continue. We've finished with the generosity of kings. And now we move on to... Religion and culture, which is the real meat of the game. This is where um, players, and I will be first, so I get to go first, and then Jen gets to go. So I get first dibs on everything. And here's the stuff we can do. We can take one specialist or god, and that means one of these cards. We can basically grab one of these cards, and only one. We can, if we have any specialists, which would be these cards down here, we can use them for their special ability. And if we don't have them, we just don't do it. But then the most important thing, you may do one of, erect a new monument, place craftsmen, or improve monuments. Basically, every turn you get to do one build action. Either build a new monument, build to, you know, to increase the size of monuments, or build craftsmen out into the world. Again, you need craftsmen to get the good um, building resources that you need to build your monuments. So, it's my turn. I can do three things. First of all, am I going to take a god or a specialist? Now, these are the five specialists. Nomads, which gives me more control over where I put monuments. Rain, which lets me you know, appeal to the rain god so I can put more water and you know, create more rivers for transportation of goods. The builder, which, makes, which means it makes me a bit cheaper for me to build um, craftsmen. The shaman, which allows me to create new resource generating spots on the board. You know, if all the clay is used up, I can put more clay out. I could put another elephant hunting ground out if I've got the shaman or herd, where if I, you know, if I have the herd ability, I can breed my cattle to make more cattle. And once somebody takes a specialist card, that's it. They've got it and they alone are the only ones who can use it for the entire game. So there is a benefit to trying to grab them first. Um, but the thing is, I'd have to pay for them right now. I've only got two bucks left. And if I wanted to take any of these things, I'd have to pay for them. I, want, I have something else in mind I want to spend this on, so I'm not going to grab any of these right now. Alternatively, I could grab a god. Basically, what that means is I determine which god I'm going to worship for the rest of the game. It's totally free to grab any of these cards, and it will give me one permanent special effect that Jen will never get to have. But I can never change my mind. Once I start worshiping a god, that's it for the whole game. And since I haven't really seen how the game is developed yet, I'm going to wait a little bit before I commit to any particular gods. So I am going to not take the option of you know, grabbing any card this turn. I'm going to go straight to my building actions. And remember, my building actions were I could put another monument somewhere out in the world. So I have two monuments on the go. I could, ex, you know, ex, what's it called? Improve my existing monuments, but to do that, I need resources, and I don't have resources yet. So the third thing is, I can make a craftsman, and that's what I'm gonna do, because without craftsmen, there are no resources to build monuments higher. Now, up here is all the craftsman technology. So if I want to build a uh, village full of potters, or wood carvers, or ivory carvers, or diamond cutters, or throne makers, or sculptors, or vessel makers, I have to learn the technology behind that. So the first thing I'm going to do before I build my craftsman village is I'm going to choose a technology that I specialize in. And I'm going to choose pottery. I am now, my, my, my civilization knows all about pottery. That means I've earned one victory point. That's what this laurel is. So come up onto the big board. Yay, I have scored a point. I've earned one victory point for knowing how to do pottery. But also you'll notice this VR plus three. My victory requirements have increased. At the beginning of the game, before I took that card, both Jen and I had a target of whoever scores 20 points first wins. However, because I am now the master of pottery here, I have to move up from 20 
to 23. I now have to score 23 points before I can win. And Jen, who hasn't taken anything, still only has to score 20. And this is a really cool feature of the game. The more abilities you get, the more powerful you become, the more points you have to score to win. And that's just brilliant. Because you can play a game of, okay, I don't want to take a lot of powers. I just want to leech off of other people so I don't need as many points. But that gives me less flexibility. All that kind of cool stuff. So anyway, I am, remember my action I'm doing here is I am actually building a pottery, I'm building a craftsman, and so because I have mastered pottery, I get to build a pottery village. So I'm going to grab a tile, um, this, this is a pottery tile, this is a vessel maker. Vessel making is an upgrade to pottery, which will happen later in the game, maybe. Maybe the upgrades will happen, maybe they won't. So I've got this one by two pottery village that I've got to place somewhere on the board, and then this will start generating goods that can be used for improving monuments. And now I think, looking at the board, you know, I can't put it where there's already anything, it has to be in a completely empty spaces, and I think I'm going to put it right here. Is that right? Yes. And I'll tell you why. Now there's a few rules, and this is the core of the game. This is the core of, the, the, of how you develop this land, the rules of how you place craftsmen out. For this craftsman to be, for any craftsman to be successful, they have to be within three spaces of at least one resource generating place. For this pottery village to be successful, it has to be close to some clay pits. If this pottery village were way the heck out here, there's no clay, I couldn't place it here because they would fail. They're too far away from this um, clay over here. Now I could put it, say, right here. Or even here, I think, yeah? Because it's diagonals count. This pottery is one, two, three. This, this clay pit is one, two, three away. So that means this clay is close enough to feed this pottery village. But I'm not going to put it down here. I'm going to put it down here. Because you'll notice this um, pottery village is now one, two, three. One, or I see, and from this clay, one, two, three, and from these clays, one, two, three, one, two, three. This pottery village now is within travel distance of almost every single clay pit in the world. There's only this one up here that's too far away. And what that means is, and I gotta put my marker on here to say that this is my pottery village. This pottery village has now basically snagged the monopoly on the majority of clay generating sites in the world. What that means is if Jen gets pottery technology later and wants to build a pottery village of her own, she could not build it, say, over here. Because um, this guy has staked, has claimed this, this clay pit, so um, that, you know she can't build it here. She can't build it to feed off this. She could still build a pottery, say, I don't know, over here somewhere. Because this is the only clay pit in the world that I have not laid claim to with my pottery village. So by going first, I've just really put the hammer down. I own almost all the clay in the world. Now I should say, um, you know, so if Jen makes one later, you know, she could put it here, or actually, interestingly, she could even put it here, let's say. Let's just say she put it there. Now, because this is one, two, three away, you know, she basically owns this clay that, you know, hers would own this one, but she can still have access to these ones that mine owns. These would now become contested, and it's whoever grabs this clay first. But um, when you put a craftsman down, it has to have access to at least, at, one, at least one uncontested space. And so, and like I said, by grabbing this one, I have made, I, I now contest the majority of clay in the world. Now, to build this pottery village costs me two cattle. It always costs two cattle to build a pottery village. So I'm gonna spend my last two bucks to build this and I put my marker on it to indicate this is mine. That was my whole turn. I passed on grabbing a card, so I want to save my money. And of the three build actions I did, I could have made another monument, I could have tried to expand a monument, but instead I placed Craftsman. My turn is now over and now it is Jen's turn. She's got the same choices. She's got her three bucks and is she going to grab a god? Is she going to grab a worker? I, mean, I, I think she, like me, is going to wait a little bit. She doesn't want to grab any of these specialists yet, because again, they cost money, and we don't have much money. She'll do that later. She doesn't want to commit to a god yet. That'll come later too. So instead, and what she could do, is, you know, so she's going to skip on the, well, actually no, maybe she will. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot one more thing. When I created my pottery village, there's one more thing I had to do. I had to set the price for how much I want pottery to cost. I can make pottery from my village cost one, two, or three cattle. And that, that's the cost to me or to Jen if she uses my village. Now, I'm just gonna go ahead and keep it cheap 
because I don't want to have to spend a lot of money on pottery myself. So this village costs one, it costs one cattle to build pottery here. I can raise that price later on if I want, but for now it costs one. So now it's Jen's turn. I think she, yeah, is she going to take a god? Yeah, I think she will take a god. Why not? She's going to take a god. And here's what she's going to do. She's going to take the cheapest god of all of them. She's going to take Zango, the Lord of Drummers. Like I said, it's maybe a bit dangerous to commit to a god right because you can't change your mind later. But, you know, Zango's a pretty cool god. He has no special power at all. He's easygoing. He has no special benefits, unlike all the other ones who can do a bunch of stuff. But here's the cool thing. With Zango's one power is VR minus two. Jen, instead of having to score 20 points, only has to score 18 points now. Whereas me, I got to score 23 points. So Jen is effectively five points in the lead, or four, because I've already scored a point. Or I'm sorry, yeah, because I've already scored a point because I did the technology. So it's become a lot easier for Jen to win now because she took that god. But she's foregone having any other really cool benefits. So she's taken a god. So that was her card grabbing phase. Now she can build. She's got three bucks. So she could build a craftsman like I did. She's not going to do that. Instead, she's going to want to expand one of, oh, is she? Yes, she is. She's going to expand one of, she's going to take this from a level one tower to a level two tower. Now, in doing that, again, if we look at the cheat sheet, a level two tower is worth three points. So she just scored two points by getting it to a level two tower. One, two. But how does she do that? How does she actually do it? She needs one resource, of, or, or I'm sorry, one good of any type to increase by one level. Um, or actually, more to the point. To, to become a two-story building, she needs to pay one resource. When, later on, when she becomes a three-story building, she has to pay two resources. And um, when, you have to, when you get to a four-story building, she has to pay three resources. And the interesting thing is you always have to pay multiples. So what she's doing is since she only has to pay one resource to go up by this floor, she is going to use my clay village. She is going to pay, remember, um, I said my place will generate pottery for one buck. She is going to pay one buck to the potter card, it goes onto this card to indicate she's paying it to that village. She's paying one buck for this village to now generate pottery for her. And so now we have to look at logistically how this works. What that means is Jen, who's in charge now, decides that the, to generate pottery from this village, if this pit, this clay pit, this clay pit, or this clay pit, um, you know, take some clay and she'll, she'll do it this one. It doesn't really matter. There's so many to choose from. She'll take this one. All the clay is now taken out of here and it is transported. And this happens virtually. This all happens instantly to the, um, to the pottery. And it's within three, one, two, three. And then the pottery has to be transferred to her monument. However, you'll notice her monument is one, two, three, four spaces away. So it can't make it. It cannot make it to the, to the monument. However, that's where the river comes in. Because you'll notice, you know, what, what she can do is the river counts as one space, no matter how big it is. So she can go one, two, three. It only took her three spaces. One, the whole river counts as her second space, and then stepping off the river was her third space. So, because she's on this river, she benefited from my pottery thing to increase the size of her tower. And, um, you know, that's why it's so powerful. Basically, she'll be able to, it's going to be much easier for her to get goods to this tower than it is for me, because i got to go over land to get stuff to my tower. Now, this pottery can, you know, can get pottery to mine, too, because it's so close. But anyway, we'll, that'll happen on the next turn. So that was Jen's turn. She got a god, which reduced her overall score requirements. She didn't get a craftsman. Um, and she did a build action, which was instead of making a craftsman village like I did, she, incre she improved her monument by paying me for some of my pottery. And that was the end of the turn. So now what happens after we've both taken our turns is we have revenues. And then finally, we see if anybody has won. Uh, revenues and then let us compare mythology. So the revenue is... We each make money equal to our tallest tower. So I have a tower of one, so I get one buck. Jen has a tower of two, she gets two bucks. So that puts her at four bucks. And also, any money we had spent up till now that went onto cards, the money that's on cards goes to its user. Remember how Jen gave a, spent a buck? That I now, at the end of my turn, get that money. I don't get the money until the end of the year. So there's always this like thing, oh, but I want that money now. I need it on my turn. But you won't get it till later. So Jen has given me a dollar. And remember early on when I bid to hold on to first player? I get that money back now. So at the end of the first year, I've got three bucks. 
Jen has got four bucks. I have a, um, you know, a, a resource generating place, which scored me a point, but I have a much higher score I have to hit. Jen, oh wait, um, you know, and Jen has made her tower taller, and she's made it easier to score. So, I don't know, I guess you could say at this point, Jen's actually doing better. But the, the game's got a long ways to go, and if you would like to watch a little bit more action and see, I mean, I've only showed the, I've only scratched the surface. I haven't showed how hubs work, how you can do long distance transportation, how you can upgrade from low level craftsmen to high level craftsmen, how the builders can radically change everything. There is still so much to this game. If you'd like to learn more, you can press the button now to watch an extended playthrough as I go through a few more rounds. Alternatively, you can push the other button to go to my final thoughts and see what I think about Zimbabwe. Either way, you can push a button in five, four, Three, two, one. Thanks a lot, everybody.